Mark Hurley reflected on his life as he sat alone in the dark. He thought he had it all. A great job, a nice house, and a loving wife. Now, he only had the first two. He remembered his nearly five-year marriage with Allison. They met at Marcus Financial Group, where she started in admin support before becoming executive assistant to his boss, Jake Marcus, seven months ago. Jake's grandfather founded the company, which is now led by his father, Alan. Alan brought Jake into the business after college to learn the ropes, and Jake quickly became regional manager. Although destined to be CEO, Jake's promotion was years away. Mark respected Alan, who helped him transition to civilian life after being wounded in the Middle East. They met during Mark's physical therapy when Alan saw potential in him and offered him a job on the spot. Mark, having just finished his business degree before deploying, accepted and started working for Alan eight years ago. He completed therapy, earned an MBA, and fell for Allison when she joined the company. They dated, fell in love, and got married, with Alan generously paying for their honeymoon in Hawaii. Three years later, Jake joined the company. But unlike his father, he was arrogant and alienated his colleagues. Alan confided in Mark about his concerns regarding Jake's behavior. You know I'll have to make him the regional manager eventually, Mark, Alan said. I know, I'm counting on you to lead by example and help Jake transition into the job. Think you can do that? Alan asked. I think so, but it won't be easy, Mark replied. What's your honest opinion of him, Mark? No sugarcoating, Alan insisted. He's too arrogant and doesn't listen to others. He spends too much time flirting and throwing his name around. Allison says he's a carnal maltreatment lawsuit waiting to happen, Mark said. Alan shook his head. I was afraid of that. His mother spoiled him. I hoped the job would help him mature. I'll talk to him. When is Bill retiring? Mark asked. Bill Collins, the current regional manager, plans to retire in the next six months. He bought a place in North Idaho for retirement, Alan explained. Alan left, promising to stay in touch. Mark knew he would. There were other things Mark noticed about Jake but didn't tell Alan. Bill retired a few months later and Jake took over. Jake made some good changes, but also micromanaged and moved people around too much, causing frustration. One day, seven months ago, Jake came to Mark's office. I've been thinking about hiring a new EA, and I think Allison would fit nicely, he said. My wife? That Allison? Mark asked. Yes, Gretchen is retiring soon and we need new blood, Jake replied. Have you talked to Allison? Mark asked. Not yet. I wanted your input first. What's she like at home? Jake asked, smirking. Mark didn't like the direction of the conversation. Allison and I are happily married, and she's a professional. If you think she's qualified, offer her the job. It's her decision, but remember, she's married to me. I get it. If she takes the job, it might mean travel. Are you okay with that? Jake asked. I trust my wife. If she accepts, she knows the boundaries. I expect you to respect our marriage, Mark said firmly. Of course, Mark. I respect you and your marriage, Jake said, still smirking. There might even be a promotion for you. That night, Mark talked to Allison. Did you talk to Jake today? Yes, he mentioned the EA position, she replied. What do you think? Mark asked. It means travel and late hours, but also a nice raise. We could use the money for when we have kids, Allison said. Are you concerned about anything? Mark asked. I'm aware of the rumors, but do you trust me? She asked. Of course I trust you, but I don't trust him. He asked about you at home, which felt inappropriate, Mark said. That's just Jake. What did you tell him? She asked. I said you're a joy to be around and that we're happily married, Mark replied. Good. I think I'll take the job, Allison decided. They went to bed and made love before falling asleep. Allison took the job, traveling every two weeks and working late three nights a week. Mark supported her and saw nothing unprofessional. Then, over three months ago, Allen had a massive stroke and died that night. The company was devastated and everyone attended his funeral. Jake expected to become CEO, but the board appointed David Matheson as interim CEO, considering Jake too inexperienced. Determined to prove himself, Jake overworked Allison, making her travel and work late, straining their marriage. Their bed life dwindled, Allison's wardrobe became more revealing, and she grew demanding and short-tempered. One Sunday, Mark confronted Allison after a New York trip. Allison, we need to talk. About what? She snapped. About us. Jake's schedule is liquidating us. We need time off to reconnect. I'm sorry, Jake's busy. Things are crazy. Tell Jake you're taking a week's vacation. We need this. After a pause, she agreed. You're right. I'll talk to him tomorrow. 
The next day Allison came home happier. Jake agreed. We can take next week off if we attend a party at his place Friday night. Party? What kind? Just a small get-together with friends. Mark felt uneasy but agreed, provided Allison came home early the rest of the week. Do you know any of these people? I've met some, Allison said. Mostly college friends of his, a couple are clients, not sure who else. I see, Mark said. All right, but come home at a normal hour this week, okay? I think so. We have the Henderson account dinner meeting on Wednesday, though. Mark knew the Henderson account was a priority since Alan's stroke. Okay, Wednesday night, but home on time the rest of the week. Deal, she smiled, wrapping her arms around him. Deal, she whispered, kissing him. The next afternoon, Jake came to Mark's office, smirking. What can I do for you, Jake? Mark asked. Allie says you're on for Friday night. Allie? Mark thought. Yes, as long as she gets home on time the rest of the week and we get next week off. We have the Henderson dinner on Wednesday. What's the party like? Mark asked. Who will be there? Just a casual get-together, a few college buddies and a client. Come casual. Just bring Allie. Mark nodded. By the way, Mark, Allie is great at her job. I appreciate you letting her do it without giving her a hard time. I'd be lost without her. Mark didn't know how to respond. Glad you're satisfied with her work. One thing, though. What's that? Jake asked. Do you call her Allie to her face? Of course. Why? Just curious. That night, he asked Allison. Do you let Jake call you Allie? You never let me. He's my boss. He can call me whatever he wants, she said. Mark dropped it, but it bothered him. The week went well, and except for Wednesday night, she was home on time. And they made love often. Friday night, Mark dressed casually and watched Allison get ready. Her dress was new, much shorter and revealing. She wore a strip he hadn't seen before and no bra. The dress had slits up the sides, exposing a lot of skin, with an open back almost revealing her strip. He could see her bosom swell against the material. Wow, you look amazing. Maybe we should stay home, she smiled. No, later. Where did you get that dress? It doesn't look casual. I got it in New York. Jake asked me to wear it tonight. Of course. Be careful, someone might get the wrong idea, she chuckled. I don't think so. Everyone knows their boundaries. They better. He hugged her and tried to kiss her, but she waved him off. Later. I don't want to mess up my makeup. They drove to Jake's townhouse in a ritzy part of town. When Jake opened the door, Mark smelled marijuana and felt uneasy. Three young men were introduced, John Whitehead, George Franklin, and Alan Jenkins, who worked for Henderson. Guys, this is Mark Hurley, Jake said with a grin. Mark, meet John, George, and Alan. Mark shook hands and wondered why Jake called him the man of the hour and didn't introduce Allison. My God, Allie, you look hot in that dress, Jake said. The men nodded appreciatively as Allison modeled the dress. Mark didn't like Jake's reaction. Let me get you drinks. Allie, white wine? Mark? That's fine, I don't drink much. Mark actually had a high booze tolerance but quit drinking years ago. He didn't want to risk it tonight. Jake returned with drinks. Allison took a big sip, while Mark took small sips, staying sober. Jake invited everyone to the living room. Mark noticed Allison sat on a love seat, and Jake quickly sat next to her. Mark took a seat opposite them, watching closely. Sorry, old buddy, force a habit, Jake said. No problem, Mark replied, glancing at his wife. They chatted until Jake asked, My dad said you were in the Marines? Yes, five years before a medical discharge, Mark answered. John asked, You ever see combat? Eliminate anyone? Mark nodded. Both. Allison looked surprised. You never told me that. It's not something I like to talk about. George pulled out a bag of marijuana. He rolled a joint and passed it around. Mark declined. Thanks, but no. I like to keep a clear head. Jake insisted. Lighten up, Mark. It's a party. You go ahead. I'd rather stay sober. Your loss. Besides, you can stay here if you get too messed up. You're off next week anyway. He turned to Allison. Rifle? Allison smiled and nodded. Sure. Jake blew smoke into her mouth and she inhaled, coughing slightly. That's good stuff, she said. Mark was stunned, not recognizing this side of her. Jake handed the joint back to George. This man, Jake said, pointing at Mark, is the best business analyst in the company. He saved us millions and brought me this lovely assistant. Allison smiled at Jake, and Mark noticed it was more than just a polite smile. She seemed to hang on his every word. I think of her as my work wife, Jake said, patting Allison's bare thigh. Mark thought he saw Jake's hand inch under her dress before pulling back. I'd be lost without her, Jake added, 
So would I, Mark said, watching Allison look down. I need to use the restroom, Mark said, breaking the silence. First door on the left, Jake directed. In the bathroom, Mark locked the door and looked in the mirror, thinking Allison might be cheating with Jake. He remembered Alan's advice about paying attention to details. Mark noticed several troubling signs. Allison's revealing dress, her interaction with Jake, her sudden pill use, and Jake calling her his work wife. He decided he needed proof. He discreetly started a video recording on his phone. Returning to the room, Mark saw Allison sit up quickly, with white powder on her nose. The others had it too. Mark sipped his drink and saw undissolved powder at the bottom. What the hell? He felt suddenly tired and incoherent. Are you okay? Allison asked. Jake and the men stood up, with Allison grabbing Jake's arm. Mark tried to stand but couldn't. Take a nap, Mark, Jake said as the men put his feet up. Allison removed his shoes and Mark noticed her strip on the love seat. Allison covered him with an afghan. I'm sorry, Mark, I really do love you, she whispered, kissing his forehead. He fell into a deep sleep. When he woke, the house was dark and silent except for snoring upstairs. He realized he'd been out for over three hours. He stopped the video recording and crept upstairs. In the master suite, he saw Allison unclothed on Jake's bed with one leg over him. One of the three men was also undressed next to her. The other two were asleep, one on a couch and the other in a recliner. Mark quietly returned downstairs. He needed to find out what they dosed him with, so he rummaged through Jake's kitchen and found a Tupperware container. He poured the drink into it and sealed it. Back in the front room, he took Allison's keychain from her purse and found an unfamiliar key. He pocketed it, then grabbed Allison's phone, intending to check it later. He placed his wedding ring on her purse so she'd see it, put on his shoes, and crept to the door. Details, he thought. He looked for a security system, but didn't see one. The unfamiliar key fit the door perfectly. He locked the door behind him and quietly left, not turning on his car lights until he was on the street. He drove to a convenience store and called his old friend R.K. Evans, who ran a private investigative firm. Hello? A sleepy R.K. answered. Hey, R.K., it's Mark. Sorry to call late, but I need your help. What's up, Mark? You need bail or something? Not quite. Can you be at my place in 20 minutes? Yeah, sure. Everything all right? I'd rather not talk about it over the phone. Gotcha. See you in 20. Thanks, buddy. Semper fee. Oorah, R.K. replied. Mark bought a 12-pack of beer and cigarettes. He hadn't smoked since leaving the service but needed something to calm him. At home, he put the beer in the fridge, lit a cigarette, and sat on the couch, using a candy dish for an ashtray. R.K. arrived and Mark offered him a beer. He explained the night's events. Holy crap, R.K. said when Mark finished. Mark handed him the container with the dosed wine. Can you get this analyzed? R.K. nodded. It'll be Monday or Tuesday before I get results. I need everything on Jake Marcus, John Whitehead, George Franklin, and Alan Jenkins. Jenkins works for Henderson Manufacturing. Here's a video of them. Got it, R.K. said. Do you want surveillance inside Jake's place and yours? Yeah, if you can. I have a key. I didn't see a security system. R.K. took the key. No problem. How'd you get this? I took it from Allison's keychain. R.K. nodded. You probably can't use any video from inside his place as evidence. I figured. This is personal. I understand, R.K. said. Mark handed him an extra key to his house and the security system code. I can set up equipment now, R.K. offered, returning the key. High-def cameras, audio, even record landline calls. Do it, Mark said. How much will this cost? Don't worry about it. You saved my skin in the Middle East. This is the least I can do. Thanks, old friend. At least let me cover your costs. All right, R.K. said. Let's go through the video for clues. Mark started the video from the beginning. Stop right there, R.K. said. Mark paused it. Back up a bit. They watched as the camera captured Allison finishing a line of white powder on the coffee table. Mark stopped the video. Damn, Mark said. I saw her just as she sat up. That definitely looks like powder on the table. Yes, it does, R.K. replied. Interesting. Have you ever known Allison to use pills? Mark shook his head. No, never. Let's see what else is on here. Mark resumed the video and they watched as he sat on the couch across from Allison. Hold up. Mark paused the video. What's that on the love seat? R.K. asked. Mark looked closely. It's Allison's strip. I saw it before I passed out but thought I was imagining it. She must have taken it off after I went to the bathroom. He resumed the video and they saw when the pill affected Mark. 
The camera showed him lying down, with the others looking down at him. They heard Allison ask if he was okay and Jake telling him to take a nap. Allison then leaned over and whispered in his ear, You sure you don't want to tie him up and make him watch us? George asked. No, Allison said. This is enough for one night. We have all week. We can always step things up if he doesn't go along, Jake said. You know John swings both ways. Maybe he could show Mark the other side, he added laughing. Mark's face turned red as he heard Allison join in. I'd like to see that, she said. Really? John asked. You'd let me screw your husband? Sure, why not, she said. Maybe if you're nice, you can get him to do more. They all laughed again. I've never done a Marine before, John said, but I doubt he can give as good a head as you. Mark fought the urge to throw his phone. Seriously, Jake, is he going to be okay? You didn't give him too much, did you? Allison asked. Nah, he'll be fine, Jake said. He'll sleep for about 12 hours and wake up with a headache. He'll think he drank too much. Tomorrow I'll introduce him to the really hard stuff. By next week, old Mark will be a powder user. Maybe I'll even have him work the street for me. Too bad dear old dad isn't around to see his golden boy fall. Is that why you hate him? Allison asked. That's all I heard about in college, Jake said. How Mark went to school while serving and fighting for America. How he worked hard while defending the country. Sometimes I thought dad would rather have Mark as a son than me. Well, guess what, dad? I'm Mark's boss now. I have Mark's woman. And by next week, your golden boy will be a powder user. They all laughed. Are you boys with me? Jake asked. They all said yes. What about you, Allie? Are you with me? If not, you'll be on the street with him. I'm with you, sweetie, Allison replied. I've grown to love this too much to walk away. They assumed she was referring to Jake's manhood. All right then, Jake said. Let's go upstairs and start the real party. Goody, Allison said, heading upstairs. This time make me airtight. The video recorded sounds of lovemaking from the bedroom. Mark stopped the video and put his head in his hands. RK placed a reassuring hand on his shoulder. This is going to be tough, but we'll get you through it, RK said. Mark nodded. Thanks, RK. What will you do? I'm divorcing her. No doubt about it. I understand. Why don't you get away for a few days? Let me handle this. What are you planning? Mark asked. It's best you don't know. We just witnessed a criminal conspiracy. Someone will go to jail, but we need you safe. But I can help, Mark insisted. R.K. shook his head. No, you're in danger. Remember Gunny Johnson? He's in Vegas now. He owes me favors and can set you up with a place. Okay, let me wire the place for audio and video first, Mark said. Stay focused, understand? Yes, thanks, R.K. You're a good friend. R.K. smiled. Semper Fi, bro. Do or die. Hurrah, Mark replied. Mark went to the porch with a beer while R.K. wired the rooms and tapped the phone. He set up the audio and video to be stored on a cloud server and gave Mark access details and the switch for the system. I'll call Gunny tomorrow and let you know. Don't do anything stupid. Understand? I understand, R.K. Good. Hang tough, my friend. I'll be in touch. And thanks again for everything, Mark said. After R.K. left, Mark turned on his computer and checked his bank accounts. He still had an account in his name from before the marriage, into which he had been depositing 10% of his earnings. Originally meant as a surprise for Allison, he transferred half of their joint account funds into this old account and paid off and canceled their joint credit cards. He still had a personal credit card from his original account. He packed clothes for a few days and loaded the suitcases into his car. Inside the house, his eyes fell on their wedding portrait over the fireplace. Filled with rage at her betrayal, he shredded the portrait with a hunting knife and tossed all photos of Allison into the fireplace. He also added her wedding dress, but decided to wait before burning everything, wanting her to witness it. Grabbing a beer, he emailed the incriminating video to himself and verified it on his laptop. He wrote a carefully worded letter to each board member and David, the interim CEO, detailing what had transpired. He reminded the board about the morals clause in Jake's employment agreement and the potential lawsuits and scandals his actions could cause. He expressed his respect for Alan and hoped the board would act appropriately. Satisfied with his letter, he attached the video and emailed it to David and the board, stating he would be on vacation but reachable by email or phone. He expected a response by Tuesday and planned to be away by then. He sat back, lit a cigarette, and watched as the heat burned Allison's face in the photo, feeling a sense of grim satisfaction. He unlocked her phone using the code he had set up for her. Going through her texts, he became even more furious. 
They had been sleeping together for at least six months, but in the last three, Allison had started openly disrespecting him. He found numerous pictures, Jake undressed, Jake and Allison kissing and dancing in a nightclub, likely in New York, and explicit photos of Allison with multiple men. There were videos, too, showing Allison having lovemaking with Jake and others, including the three men from the party. He realized this was what she had been doing on her work trips. He copied everything and emailed it to himself using her phone. By then, he had downed six beers and smoked half a pack of cigarettes, using her face in the photos as an ashtray. Seeing the sunrise, he knew Allison would wake soon and discover he had left. Expecting her to be up within an hour or two, he grabbed his loaded rifle, locked the door and lay on the couch trying to get some sleep. Allison woke at 8.30, checked the clock on Jake's nightstand, and went to the bathroom to clean up. Jake and the others were awake by the time she came out. Jake threw on a robe and looked at her. Want to go downstairs and start breakfast? Jake asked. Mark will probably want coffee if he's waking up. Sure, she said, tossing on a robe and padding downstairs. She started a pot of coffee and went to wake Mark in the living room, but he wasn't there. The afghan was tossed aside and his shoes were gone. She ran around checking the bathroom, but he wasn't there. She saw the car was gone and his ring on her purse. Oh, crap, she gasped, running upstairs. Jake stopped her in the bedroom. What's wrong? He's gone. What do you mean gone? He must have woken up and left. He took the car and left his ring. Call him and get him to come back. Okay, she said, running downstairs. She put Mark's ring in her purse and looked for her phone, but couldn't find it. By then, Jake was downstairs. My phone is gone. Use the house phone. You don't understand. It's full of texts, pictures, and videos you sent. If he has it, he's seen them. Don't worry. Just get him over here. We'll handle it. Now call him. Allison picked up the house phone and nervously dialed Mark's cell. Hello? Mark answered, sounding groggy. Mark, sweetie, it's me. What the hell do you want? He growled. Allison recoiled. He had never spoken to her like that before. She realized he must be super pissed, but she had no idea just how much. Mark, honey, you weren't here when I got up and I was worried. Are you all right? What the hell do you care, witch? Sweetheart, I need you to come pick me up at Jake's house. Can you do that, please? Mark laughed. Screw you. I may have been clueless yesterday, but not anymore. You don't get to call me sweetheart or honey ever again. Mark, please don't be angry. I do love you. Yeah, right, witch. Tell me another one. Mark, we need to talk. Damn right we do. Then come pick me up at Jake's so we can talk on the way home. Wrong answer, witch. I'm not coming over there. If you want to talk, walk or call an Uber. The only thing we need to discuss is how to split everything up. What do you mean split everything up? That's what happens in a divorce, witch. I don't want a divorce. Can't we work this out? I didn't want to be dazed and cucked either. Get home if you want to talk, but don't let Jake or anyone else come here. I'm armed, and I'll blow their heads off if they step foot in my house. Got it? Okay, I'll call an Uber. Do that and bring cash, or your ATM card. Why? Because your credit card doesn't work anymore. Why doesn't it work? I canceled it last night. Oh, she said quietly. By the way, know where my phone is? Yeah, it's here on the coffee table. Got an interesting collection of pictures and videos. Now I know what you've been doing these last three months. They'll help my divorce case. Oh my God, Mark, I'm really sorry. I never wanted to hurt you. Shut up, witch. Save your excuses for someone who cares. If you want to talk, do it now and come alone. I'll be there, Mark. Ending the call, she looked at Jake. Well, Jake asked. He's not coming. I have to go there to talk to him. All right, we'll take you then. She shook her head. No, he's armed. He said if any of you show up, he'd eliminate you. I have never heard him so angry. Jake thought for a moment, then went to his study. He came back with a syringe. Here's the plan. Put this in your purse. Call an Uber, and we'll follow you to your place. When you get a chance, inject this into his arm. Then call me. We'll pick him up and put him in my trunk. What is it? She asked. A special concoction. Some dope, smack, and something to knock him out. It works fast and won't hurt him. Just stick him with it and call me when he's out. Got it? He handed her the syringe and she put it in her purse. Okay, she said. Just promise you won't hurt him. We'll do our best. Right, boys? He said, looking at the three men who laughed. Call for your ride. She arranged an Uber to pick her up in 30 minutes and went upstairs to finish getting ready. When the driver arrived, she left. Jake and his friends followed, parking a block away. They didn't notice the white van parked across the street. A few minutes after speaking to Allison, Mark's phone rang. It was R.K. 
What's up? Mark asked. Just wanted to let you know my boys picked up a conversation between your wife and her accomplices, R.K. said. What? Mark asked. Modern technology, my friend, R.K. said. A parabolic microphone picked it up. Your wife is getting an Uber, and her buddies are following. They're planning to dose you and kidnap you. It's in her purse. She'll hit you with it when she can. My boys will follow Jake and his crew. Damn, Mark said. Yeah, R.K. said. Be careful. I'll text you when they leave. Turn on the surveillance gear when she gets there, and I'll monitor it. I'm just down the street. I'll call the cops when needed. Be ready. Okay, thanks. About half an hour later, Mark got the text. On the move. Showtime, Mark muttered. He had about 20 minutes before they arrived, so he stashed the rifle where Allison wouldn't find it easily and turned on the surveillance gear. In the kitchen, he grabbed a Ziploc bag for the syringe and a tissue. Watching from the window, he saw the Uber pull up and Allison nervously exited the car, clutching her purse. He turned on the fireplace, setting the photos and her dress ablaze. When she walked in, she grimaced at the cigarette smoke. Her eyes widened at the sight of the burning portrait and her wedding dress. You're burning my wedding dress? Our pictures? Mark, why are you doing this? Tears streamed down her face, but Mark was unmoved. I wanted you to see what your actions have done to us. She glanced at the beer bottles and cigarette butts in her candy dish. I thought you had a low booze tolerance and I never knew you smoked. I quit smoking, and as for drinking, I get mean when drunk. I nearly liquidated a man once. I chose not to drink again, just like you chose to become Jake's witch. Oh my God, Mark, what have I done? You tell me. What happened to you? You used to be so sweet and kind. Since when have you snorted cocaine? Who are these men you've been with? Mostly clients, she said quietly. Jake made me. Great. Your actions could ruin Marcus Financial. How long have you planned to pill me and assault me? Was that your idea or Jake's? She looked shocked. I never... She began, but Mark cut her off. Shut up, he said, pulling out his phone. He played the video of her and her accomplices talking over him. Her face turned white as she heard her own words. How did you get that? She asked. It doesn't matter, Mark said. What's important is that David and the board members now have this video. The police will have it too. We're getting divorced, and if I have my way, you'll be in prison for a long time. I just want to know why. You don't understand, she said. It's a long story. Maybe you can tell me one day when I'm not so inclined to wring your neck, Mark said. He saw her start to open her purse and ripped it off her shoulder, dumping the contents on the coffee table. He picked up the syringe with a tissue. Is this what you planned for me? Do you even know what it is? Not exactly. Not exactly, he asked sarcastically. You were going to inject me without knowing what it could do. You're one sick witch. Did Jake tell you to do this? She nodded. Yes. So if Jake told you to shove a hot poker up your bum, you'd do that too. You were supposed to inject me, then call him to come kidnap me, right? Ashamed, she nodded. Pretty much. All right, here's what we'll do. Call Jake, put it on speaker, and tell him you did it. I'll take it from there. Don't let him know I'm waiting, got it? You want me to set him up? Yes, any questions? She shook her head. No, I understand. Good, now do it, and no tricks. Mark watched as she called and put the phone on speaker. Jake, it's me, Allie, it's done, he's out. Good girl, we'll be right there. She ended the call and looked at Mark. He'll eliminate me when he sees you're not out. Tough luck, remember, no signals. Otherwise, I might eliminate you myself. Mark sat in a recliner and waited. When he saw Jake and his three buddies through the window, he pretended to be asleep but kept his eyes slightly open. Jake walked in, looked at the mess, and started toward Mark. You did good, Jake told Allison. Now we're going to put him in the trunk. As Jake reached for Mark, Mark opened his eyes and smashed Jake in the throat. Before Jake could react, Mark kicked him hard in the lap. The other three men tried to help, but R.K.'s team detained them. Jake fell to his knees, moaning in pain. Mark slipped behind him, pulled out his hunting knife, and grabbed Jake's hair, positioning the knife at his throat. Make your peace with God, Mark growled. I'm going to cut your head off. Jake pissed his pants in fear, and Allison recoiled in horror, wondering who this monster was. Mark began pressing the knife against Jake's throat when R.K. shouted, Sergeant, don't do it. Drop the knife. The police are on their way. He deserves to die, Mark exclaimed. R.K. knelt in front of Jake. Yes, he does, but not by your hand. If you eliminate him, you'll end up in prison. Let the authorities handle it. Please, as a friend, put the knife down. 
He'll pay for what he's done. Mark looked at R.K., feeling Jake trembling in fear. Slowly, he pulled the knife away and stood up. R.K. turned Jake over, zip-tied his hands, and told Allison to lay face down as he secured her hands. Hot tears fell from her eyes as she watched a picture of her and Mark burn in the fireplace. Mark sat on the couch, watching R.K. secure both Allison and Jake. The other three were secured in the front yard by R.K.'s men. Police sirens grew louder as cruisers stopped in front of the house. Hand me your phone, R.K. said. I'll talk to the police before they come inside. Mark handed him the phone. As R.K. left, Jake turned to face Mark, his smirk finally gone. My father always did love you more than me, Jake said. Not true, Jake, Mark replied. He always hoped you'd mature enough to step into his shoes one day. Would you really have cut my head off? Jake asked. We'll never know, will we? Mark replied. But I promise you, where you're going, you'll meet people who won't hesitate like I did. And if you come after me again, I won't hesitate either. Jake laid his head back in silence. Three large police officers entered, surveyed the scene, and read Jake and Allison their Miranda rights before escorting them to the cruisers. One officer picked up the syringe in the plastic bag from the coffee table. Is this what they plan to use on you? He asked Mark. Yes, it is, Mark confirmed. The officer took Mark's full statement and said, You were lucky, you know that? No, my fellow Marine had my back. The officer smiled and nodded. Semper Fi, the officer said, shaking Mark's hand. Ura, Mark responded. After the police left, R.K. joined Mark on the couch. Got another one of those? He asked, pointing at the beer bottles. Think I have one or two left. Kinda early for this, don't you think? After this? No, R.K. said as Mark handed him a cold bottle. How are you holding up? Okay. Feels like Iraq. I need to decompress. Yeah, about that, I talked to Gunny. He'll take care of everything if you want to hang out in Vegas for a few days. Here's his number. I might do that. Got some things to handle here first. R.K. handed Mark two cards. Gunny's number and a divorce lawyer, Michelle Hawkins. She hates cheaters and expects you at 8 a.m. Monday. Thanks for everything, Mark said. Semper Fi, bro. Do or die, R.K. said. Ura, Mark replied. After finishing their beers, R.K. stood up. You have some cleaning to do. I'll be by later to get the surveillance gear. R.K. left, and Mark started cleaning the house. That afternoon, Mark received a call from David Matheson. Mark, this is David Matheson, he said when Mark answered. Yes, Mr. Matheson, what can I do for you? Mark asked. Call me David. I got your email and saw the video, as did the board. We agree with your letter, which was impressive. Thank you, David. You're welcome. We also agreed to terminate both Allison and Jake's employment immediately, given they're in custody. I'm heading to the county jail to handle it personally. There's something else. What's that? Mark asked. We think you should take a few days to unwind. Do you have some place to go? A friend offered to look after me in Vegas. I have a divorce lawyer appointment Monday. Then I'll head out. Vegas sounds perfect. Enjoy your trip, Mark. We'll see you a week from Monday. Thanks, David. I will. One more thing. We unanimously decided you'd be the best person to take Jake's job. Me? Mark asked. Yes. We're impressed with how you handled this and the board values your work. There will be a salary increase and other benefits. You deserve it. Thanks, David. Don't thank me yet. First, you'll oversee an external audit of everything Jake handled. The auditors will report to you, and you'll report to me. I think that's a good idea. I've learned Jake had Allison engage in lovemaking with some clients. Good God. Well, I'll leave that to you. Have a good trip, and we'll see you a week from Monday. See you then, David. Thanks. After the call, Mark finished cleaning the house and mowed the yard. He called Gunny Johnson, and they caught up. So, you want to come out for a few days and have some fun? Gunny asked. Yeah, sure. All right, come on out. I'll set you up with a nice room and show you the ropes. But remember, this is Las Vegas, not Bangkok. They laughed. I'll remember, Gunny, Mark said. See you Monday evening. See you, Mark, Gunny replied. RK stopped by to gather his equipment. Quick update. Cops searched Jake's place and found a ton of pills, lovemaking toys, DVDs, and more. Jake was a real creep. My friend on the force said there's likely more illegal stuff they haven't found yet. Damn. RK stayed for dinner and Mark fell asleep shortly afterward, mentally and physically exhausted. The next day, Mark tossed all of Allison's belongings into trash bags and hauled them to the garage, planning to wait on taking them to Goodwill until he knew she'd be going to prison. The following morning, he arrived at Michelle Hawkins' office at 8 a.m. 
She reviewed his evidence and paperwork, making notes as he spoke. She explained California's divorce laws, noting that everything is generally divided equally. Since they had no children and the house was his before marriage, he'd likely keep the house, while Allison would get the remaining half of their bank accounts. Her infidelity couldn't be brought up in the divorce, but the criminal charges might influence the judge. She also mentioned he probably wouldn't have to pay support while she was incarcerated, though that could change upon her release. I'll make this as painless as possible, Michelle assured him. I'll draw up the papers and have them served. If she signs, I'll present them to the judge, and it'll be a six-month wait. Mark agreed and gave her a retainer. Before heading home, he stopped by the county jail to inform Allison he was filing for divorce. Sitting at a table, he watched as she was brought out, looking haggard in an orange jumpsuit. They picked up the handsets to communicate through the plexiglass shield. Hello, Allison. Hello, Mark. I wanted to let you know I'm filing for divorce. I saw an attorney today. I figured you would, she said. When is your arraignment? Tomorrow morning. The prosecutor is asking for no bail. That's probably best. Now tell me something honestly. What's that? She asked. What happened to you? She looked down, embarrassed. Things were going well at first. Jake seemed like any other executive. After Alan died, Jake got furious he wasn't promoted and blamed you. He thought his father set things up for you. That's crazy, Mark said. Alan hoped Jake would become CEO one day. I know, she said. We went to New York that weekend. At a club with clients, dancing and drinking, I flirted a bit, but didn't think I was out of line. Next thing I know, I felt really good and ended up in bed with two guys. Jake joined in later. She paused. The next morning, I felt guilty. Then Jake showed me pictures and videos he took and said I had to do whatever he wanted or he'd show you. So he blackmailed you, Mark said, and probably dazed you too. He did, he admitted it later. No surprise they found pills at his place. Did he get you on powder? She nodded. Yes, and dope and other stuff. How many clients did you sleep with? She shrugged. I don't know, several. Jake set it all up whenever we traveled. Mark shook his head. From the video, it seemed like you enjoyed dazing me turning me into a powder user for Jake. Was Wednesday's dinner really about the Henderson project? She shook her head. No, we were planning Friday's party. So you planned it all in advance? Allison nodded. Yes, I'm sorry, Mark. That's the first thing you've said that I agree with. Can you forgive me? He chuckled. Not just no, but hell no. You cheated on me with that idiot and who knows how many others. Then you plotted to pill and assault me. You're out of your mind and don't even ask if we can be friends. I understand, Mark. I hope it was worth it. Goodbye, Allison. He hung up as tears fell down her cheeks. He went home, packed, and headed for Vegas. He met up with Gunny Johnson, and they reminisced over dinner. Gunny then showed him around, gave him gambling tips, and escorted him to his room. Inside, a lovely young brunette sat on the bed. She stood up as they entered. Mark, this is Candy, Gunny said. She'll be your tour guide while you're here. Gunny, this isn't necessary. Mark said. Nonsense, son. This is exactly what you need after what your wife put you through. Relax, have a good time, and remember, what happens here stays here, usually. They laughed. I gotta go. You two have fun, Gunny added. Before he left, Mark turned to Candy. Tell me, are you an escort, courtesan? Not anymore, Candy said. Thanks to Gunny, I'm out of a bad situation. I'm clean, going to school, and working a real job. He told me about you and asked if I'd spend time with you. That's all. If you want, I'll leave and never bother you again. No, Mark said. He's right. I could use some companionship right now, and you're a very lovely woman. Would you like to go out for a drink? That sounds nice, she said, smiling. They went to the club, had a few drinks, talked and danced for a few hours. Back in his room, she helped him forget his troubles. He woke up to find her beside him. They showered together and got dressed. I have classes today, but I can meet you back here tonight if you want, she said. Sounds like a plan, he said. They kissed before she left, and he went downstairs for breakfast. Then he headed to the casino to try his luck. Following Gunny's advice, he walked away with about $300. He spent it on dinner, drinks, and a show with Candy that night. Once again, she rocked his world. The rest of the week went about the same, and by Friday, he was ready to go home and move on with his life. Candy hated to see him leave, but understood. She gave him her phone number and email address in case he wanted to reach out again. He liked her but doubted it would turn into a full relationship. She was much younger and had her whole life ahead of her. Still, he thought, who knows? He drove home with a smile, 
memories of Candy filling his mind. When he got home, he caught up on news about Allison and her group. The judge, after reviewing the evidence from the prosecutor, ordered them held without bail. He also received confirmation from Michelle that Allison had been served divorce papers. According to Michelle, Allison signed them right away and they were filed with the court. In six months, he would be free of her for good. The following Monday, he went to work and found all his things moved into Jake's old office. Everyone welcomed him back and wished him well in his new position. He settled in and met the external auditors. He got them situated and met his new assistant, Marsha Bodine. He had known her since she started with the company a few years ago. He liked Marsha, knew she was married, and she had received high praise from her previous supervisors. She also knew his situation and was careful not to mention it. The audit uncovered several irregularities in Jake's paperwork. For instance, he had fudged his expense account on trips he and Allison had taken. Then the auditors found that Jake had mismanaged some client accounts. This was reported to the SEC, and Jake soon faced federal charges. Mark and David spent the next few months cleaning up the mess Jake left behind. Luckily, they didn't lose any clients thanks to their quick response, but they had several uncomfortable conversations with other executives who were understandably upset. Meanwhile, Mark stayed in touch with Candy, mostly through emails. Eventually, she told him she had met someone at school and they were serious. He wasn't surprised and wished her well. At the same time, Allison and Jake's trials dragged on with more charges and motions. Mark found himself testifying against his wife and her accomplices, even though her defense team tried to discourage him, saying he wasn't required to testify against his wife. I may not be required to, but I want to, he told her lawyer. Besides, in a few weeks... She won't be my wife anymore. The jury was stunned by his testimony, and even more so when the video Mark took that Friday night was played for them. Finally, the day came for the jury to announce their verdicts. Mark and David sat in the courtroom, watching as Alice and Jake and the other three men were brought in. None of them could meet Mark's gaze. By now, the trial had become a media spectacle. The court was called to order, and the judge asked if the jury had reached a decision. The foreman stood and confirmed they had. Everyone held their breath as the judge read through the charges, which included conspiracy to kidnap and assault. Jake faced additional charges related to the pills found in his townhouse and the lewd photos and videos he had with other women. They were all found guilty on every charge. The judge set the date for sentencing and the five convicted conspirators were led out of the courtroom. Mark and David walked out, brushing past the throng of reporters pushing cameras in their faces. About ten days later, the sentencing took place. The judge made it clear he was thoroughly disgusted with all five of them and essentially threw the book at them. Jake's three buddies got the lightest sentences but still faced 20 years in prison. Allison was sentenced to 25 years to life, and Jake received 50 years to life for his crimes. He would also face federal charges brought by the SEC to be handled in federal court. Allison sobbed as she was led out of the courtroom, while Jake looked down in shame as he was taken away. Jake's time in prison ended about six months later, when he was found decapitated in the shower, having angered the wrong people who didn't like his smug attitude. A month after the sentencing, Mark was in his office going over some paperwork, when Marsha buzzed him on the intercom. Mr. Hurley, there's a Dr. Kristen Marcus here to see you. The last name caught Mark's attention. Send her in. The door opened and Mark saw an attractive blonde enter his office. Her hair fell below her shoulders and she wore a skirt that fell just below her knees. She smiled as she approached, extending her hand. It's great to finally meet you, Mr. Hurley. He shook her hand and invited her to sit. Please call me Mark. Would you like something to drink? Coffee? Tea? Coffee would be wonderful. Black, please, and call me Kristen. Mark asked Marcia to get them each a cup of coffee and sat down as his assistant left the office. Marcus, Mark said, looking at her. Are you related to Alan? His daughter, perhaps? She smiled and shook her head. No, I'm his niece. I see. I'm surprised we haven't met before. I thought I knew everyone in Alan's family. I've been quite busy. I was in France when Uncle Alan died and couldn't make it back for his funeral. So, what can I do for you? He asked. I just wanted to meet the man who took my idiot of a cousin down. I take it there's no love lost between you two? She shook her head. No, none, she said quietly. I'm just glad he's finally paying for his crimes. I'm really sorry for what he did to you. From what I know, you didn't deserve any of it, and I'm sorry. I've heard a lot about you from my uncle. So, I see you're a doctor. Are you a medical doctor? No, I have a PhD in business and economics. I teach at UCLA. 
My uncle and I shared many interests, but I'm more focused on academics. And no, I'm not interested in moving into the corner office upstairs. Mark laughed at that. They talked for a while longer before she said she had to get back to work. Mark didn't want the conversation to end, and truth be told, he was interested in this woman. Listen, Kristen, I'd love to continue this discussion over dinner, that is, if you don't mind being seen in public with a lowly MBA. She smiled and her eyes sparkled. There's nothing lowly about being an MBA, and I'd love to be seen with you in public. Dinner sounds great. How about Red Lobster tonight at 7 o'clock? She handed him a card with her number and address. Red Lobster it is, Mark said, taking the card from her. I'll pick you up at 6.30 if that works. I'll see you then. Mark, it's been great meeting you, she said before walking out. That evening, Mark learned from Kristen that Jake had tried to assault her when she had just turned 18. Ashamed and afraid she might be blamed, she never said anything but avoided Alan and his family as much as possible. She also avoided relationships with men because of Jake's actions and spent months in therapy while in college. He told her about his experience with Jake and what happened with Allison. Kristen was shocked, but not surprised. I'm so sorry. You deserve much better. Mark and Kristen dated for several months, falling in love. She nearly tackled him to the floor, smothering him with kisses when he asked her to marry him. I take it that's a yes? Mark asked when she finally let him breathe. No, that's a hell yes, she said. Now carry me to bed and ravish me properly. Yes, ma'am, Mark said, carrying his bride to be upstairs. Yes, he thought, things were looking good.